very nice to meet you all. Um, my name is Michael Brown. I am a postdoc in archaeology at Edinburgh University. Um, I'm also from Leicester as well, so this is cool. I get to come and do a conference and go see my mum, which is awesome. <laughs> so, um, in addition to being a Near Eastern archaeologist doing late Bronze, early Iron Age, um, I have for the past year been uh, working part-time on a brewing degree at Harriet Watt University um, with the intention of bringing the two together to do biochemical um, approaches to reconstructing ancient beer. So the idea is take all the archaeological information about process and look at the microbiological and chemical aspects of what doing beer making in that way, what brewing in that way would mean in practice. Um, so this has been quite fruitful, and we've come up with um, a little bit more information which we've gleaned from earlier <coughs> botanical reports about uh, what we could use for bittering agents, for example. So we've managed to move things on a little bit. Um, as part of this work, I've been very happy to speak on uh, two occasions now with the wonderful Dr. Patrick McGovern, who is the world's leading expert on ancient fermented beverages. Pat is basically a show-off. Um, he has not once, but twice discovered the world's oldest fermented beverage beating himself. Um, I think he's got an inside track somehow. I don't know how he's doing this. But, um, so the example of beer is a uh, 4th millennia BC uh, barley beer from Godin Tepe in Iran. Um, that was discovered by residue analysis on a shirt excavate, excavated 30 years prior. Um, so that's a fantastic reason to go back and look at old collections. Um, and uh, more recently, he's also found a 7,000-year-old fermented beverage um, from the north part of the Yellow River Valley in China. Um, as part of his work, he's also worked with breweries to make recreation beers, which is something else um, a few speakers will be talking about today. Um, what we were hoping to do originally with this interview we held on Monday with uh, Jeff and myself, it's inexplicably hiding on the floor. Yeah, there wasn't a chair. Oh, sorry. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, like, uh, right. So the idea originally was we were going to have an interactive Skype chat with Patrick. Um, what actually happened on Monday when Jeff and I went into a very nice building um, in order to have this all set up, about five minutes before we were about to begin, the building was actually caught on fire. <laughs> and um, we had to leave and leg it as fast as possible to uh, um, Jeff's flat, actually, which had the nearest internet. So um, what we couldn't get the video working in the short time, uh, but luckily nobody burnt to death, which is super. So that's why I'm here today, along with Jeff, who's on the floor again. That's strange. <laughs> so um, we will now reenact the interview using the audio we did manage to grab with Patrick on Monday. And Patrick found this very funny and did manage to send us some slides over as well. So um, shall, we, shall we begin? Right, so um, hello, Patrick. Good morning, Michael. How are you? Good, good thanks, Pat. <laughs> Cheers. Um, <laughs> right. So um, the first thing I'd like to ask you about today, Pat, is uh, why should we care about brewing heritage? And the reason I was asking Pat about this is because we are hoping to address the wider social context of uh, why bring heritage is important. So, Pat. Well, because it is very central to human culture and even biology, in my opinion. I mean, we don't have all the you know, evidence from the Paleolithic period that we like, which represents maybe 99% of our species' uh, existence on this planet. But, but if we think about how we're set up to drink fermented beverages and how many other animals uh, a fermented beverage or two, uh, then uh, you know, we can make inferences about how the Paleolithic period and how it may have shaped us uh, both biologically and culturally. So, for instance, uh, as humans, you know, we have sensory organs, you know, taste buds, and uh, olfactory nerves, and so forth, that pick up the aroma of alcohol, but also the aroma of fermentation. And fermentation is really a basic process of how you preserve food, add flavors. And, and create alcohol too. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, it's, it's a very basic uh, process of life itself. I mean, it's the uh, almost every all the cells in our body are, are being supplied energy uh, by the uh, glycolysis or fermentation process, as you know, uh, studying uh, at the, the brewing school. So uh, once we uh, we take some. Uh, uh, beverage, you know, we could attract it and we take it into our mouths. Uh, if it happens to have a lot of carbohydrates in it, we have special enzymes in our saliva that will break down the carbohydrates and sugar if we spit it out, and then yeast uh, 
uh, inoculate to you know, ferment a beverage that way. But then, you know, following the biological part of this, after we swallow uh, the drink, it goes, you know, eventually to the liver, where we have 10% of the enzymes in the liver uh, convert alcohol into energy. So we see that's a very basic part of human existence. Then if we look at the cultural side of it, uh, especially for Africa, where every village basically has its own fermented beverage, then, and it's very central, you know, sometimes it's at the brewery, right at the center of the village, uh, and then the beverage itself gets incorporated into all life's and death's events, you know, whether a funeral or celebration of some sort. So uh, this is something that's been, that's been perpetuated, you know, around the world as we going from place to place, learning how to make fermented beverages and incorporating them into our social structures. So I just think it's, it's like essential to, um, to understanding where we've come from. Cool, excellent. So um, I think what, sort of just to summarize very quickly that, I think what Pat was sort of saying about the way that um, he has, and to myself as well, sort of, are interested in engaging in brewing heritage is trying to see as a holistic thing, right? From a biological phenomena, with you know, it's very much part of our you know our physical selves, drinking alcohol, consuming alcohol, and processing it, and also putting that all the way through to the cultural and not seeing it as a separation of the two, seeing it very much as a spectrum, because there are sort of by bringing together some quite sort of hardcore organic chemistry and the brewing heritage, you can actually enhance both. You can, you can't really do them separate. I think is sort of the main point there. Um, Right, so um, a very quick plug, not for me, for Pat. Um, Pat's written a very accessible book called Uncorking the Past, and this contains uh, all the information he's done about the recreation beverages and the, the ancient beverages which he's come up with. Um, one of the, the interesting characteristics of all these extremely old beverages in the Neolithic is that they're almost all uh, mixed beverages, they're grogs. There's no just wine, no just mead, no just beer. Um, so the name that's been used for these is Extreme Beverages. So, Pat, what's it on the floor? Pat, pretend Pat. What is an extreme beverage, and which is your favorite, and why? Okay, uh, my definition of extreme beverage, and I suppose others you know, have different ones, uh, or you could call it a hybrid beverage or a mixed fermented beverage, is where you take a lot of different ingredients, you know, not just your Reinheit to boat uh, beer, you know, with hops, barley, water, and some yeast, but you can throw in all kinds of other things, you know, all different fruits, depending on where you are in the world, you know, you take those fruits that are available, you know, or palm, nectar, you know, that comes out of the palm tree, you know, the, the resin uh, for the fruits, uh, honey, of course, which is the most concentrated form of sugar in nature, and so it also has yeast associated with it, so once you dilute it, you can ferment into mead very easily. And then all sorts of carbohydrates that, as I mentioned before, you can chew and spit out, and an uh, insect may come by with some yeast on it and inoculate it to get the, the beer produced that way. Or you can sprout it and make a malt, of course, and make the beer that way. So, And then herbs. I think herbs and spices are, are the other essential element of uh, extreme fermented beverage. And my favorite? Hmm. Uh, well, I, I have to go with Chateau Jiahu from China because it's the earliest uh, of baby that we've identified chemically dating back to 7000 BC. But also, uh, you know, it's in that Neolithic period when all sorts of new discoveries and domestications are occurring. Okay, so um, Chateau Jahu was mentioned there, and that's um, the recreation which Pat worked on with Dogfish Head Brewery. So this is um, a recreation of a 7,000-year-old beverage based on chemical residue analysis, and then he's gone to a microbrewery and worked some beverage, and this is um, something that's available in quite a lot of bottle shops, actually, in the States. You can just wander in, and a uh, 7,000-year-old recreation beverage is fantastic. Um, so the next question I asked Pat was, what are the challenges of working with organizations like Dogfish on these recreation brews? Ask him. Oh, sorry. Pat, what are the challenges? Let's see if he's doing a finger down here. It's really weird. What are the challenges of working on with organizations like Dogfish Head Brew, please, Patrick? Well, it has its, its challenges. 
you know, if you're trying to make also a commercial product, uh, you might get uh, railroaded. You know, it's just mm-hmm. like it really isn't as legitimate as you'd like, or as, you know, true to the information that's available. But doctors have been very, very good that way because they're, you know, it already had the idea. The, the brewer and the owner, Sam Calcione. Mm-hmm. That beer was much more than just the Reinheit's devote beer. You know, mm-hmm. that it really could uh, uh, extreme beverage, you know, mixed beverage, or hybrid beverage. And so he'd already experimented a lot with that. And when we got together, which is another long story, it, uh, you know, it was basically that we wanted to do as genuine a version of each recreated beverage as we could. Now, you're always limited in the equipment you've got. And Usually they can only test, you know, one, well, let's say three or four uh, variables, or there may be hundreds of variables mm-hmm. that you could test. And, and then at the end of it, because you want to come up with something that's drinkable, but that, I mean, that has its, uh, uh, its justification because, you know, humans in antiquity, you know, have the same sort of sense organs we do, and would have known what they like, but of course they're also influenced by cultural uh, norms. Well, so uh, we ran into real problems. I think that you know, Sam Sam was ready to put as much money into any beverage, and, you know, it was, was needed to try to get it as genuine as possible. So, for instance, like right as such, we didn't know what the bittering agent was, but I suggested to him, why not try saffron because St. Church was very, Anatolia was very famous for saffron, and you know that turned out to be a delicious beverage, but of course, it was very expensive. The first batch he made he used only the best saffron, and so this is the most expensive spice in the <laughs> world. It's, uh, you know, that that was a problem. But, the, but then we we ran into real problems though with the alcohol, tobacco, firearms, and the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, when we wanted to use other ingredients because they have very arcane rules. You know, a lot of them are coming from prohibition days of what. Uh, can go into an alcoholic beverage. So, for instance, uh, Shaka Jahu, we wanted to use Hawthorne fruit, but they said we could not use fresh fruit. Uh, that was illegal in an alcoholic beverage. So then we finally ended up using a powdered uh, version, uh, which, uh, you know, wasn't quite the same, but, you know, it was okay. But then you have issues about yeast. Now, you'd like to use the native yeast of the region. Uh, where the recreated beverage is coming from, but you don't always have access to it. I mean, in one case, we did collect yeast in a date palm grove in Egypt to make Tahankit. Uh, we reconstructed an Etruscan yeast with a, a colleague who did DNA studies uh, or Etrusca, and, and so forth. So, mm. you know, we, we've tried, you know, using pottery vessels, bronze vessels, and so forth where appropriate. But usually we end up, you know, with a standard, uh, small, sort of ancient brewing setup that is in Rehoboth Beach at the brew pub. Mm. And, uh, of course, the same methods of brewing has gone on for thousands of years, so in a way that's justified too. Cool, so just to recap very briefly what Pat was talking about, I didn't notice how big that bottle of Chateau Jahu was next to Pat. That was really quite disturbingly odd, actually, what was going on there. Um, one of the issues he flagged up there was about the issue of sort of biological authenticity when you get to technologies like fermentation. Um, one of the things which you do run into is all these early beverages would have been fermented using wild yeast, either wild yeast through spontaneous fermentation or wild yeast through recropping of Krausen, so taking the ferment from the previous batch and putting it into the new one, repitching. Um, there's some quite interesting morphological differences between wild yeast, wild yeast populations of Saccharomyces cerevisiae and domesticates. The domesticates tend to be larger and they produce an awful lot less sulfur. So one of the problems you have in trying to do an authentic reconstruction is when you want to use these wild yeast samples, you have to bring them in, you have to culture them over several generations to make sure they're clean, they're not got any lactobacillus in them as well. Because if you introduce a wild yeast sample into a brewery, it's extremely difficult to get it out again. 
and it can change the literally the ecosystem of that building. So one of the things which sort of leads you on to think about is in these original sort of mud brick structures where they had brewing operations going on, the yeast populations were endemic in the structure of the building. So one of the things which is very difficult to replicate without essentially contaminating some of these production environments. So what's... Oh, oh, sorry, I'll do it properly this time. So Pat, who's obviously here, um, what is the future for research in brewing? Where to next? Well, I think there's many parts of the world that we don't know too much about that need more archaeological excavation and scientific analysis, such as Australia, India, North America, where we don't really have any good evidence of what kind of brewing or alcoholic beverages they were making. And yet, presumably, they, they had access to sugar-rich plants, um, you know, high sugar resources, you know, honey or whatever, fruits. So... We need, I think, really to, you know, try to open up those parts of the world and, and what's going on. Well, because especially in the case of Australia and North America, it's claimed that the North American Indians, for instance, never had a, a fermented beverage until very late. And, of course, once they got introduced by the Europeans, they went overboard. But presumably, you know, like the Mexicans, when American, first Americans came across Bering Strait to the Americas, they would have, um, like the you know ancient Maya or Aztec, you know they would have been aware of uh, making fermented beverages, you know whether from uh, the or of maize or corn or from other fruits, agave, that goes into tequila today. So uh, the same with Australia, you know if they crossed over say sixty thousand years ago to that continent, and there are you know, bees there that are producing honey, and there's special types of fruits of all kinds with carbohydrate resources they could have chewed. Why don't we have any evidence for that? It seems like 60,000 years would be more than enough time, you know, to have figured out something. Right, so just to clarify as well, that's not a picture of Pat on holiday. He is actually, he's actually searching for early wine cultivars, so um, early grapevine cuttings there, so he's not on holiday. We'll go and do that. So, next question. Um, this is a question which we took from Twitter. Uh, um, we had lots of interesting questions. The one we selected was asking Pat about uh, ethnographic information regarding beer and how is that information relevant how close it is when you're studying ancient beverages. That's very important because of the, uh, the strong tradition that's attached to alcoholic beverages in every culture. You know, like take our culture, wine, you know, is incorporated into the Eucharist, uh, into other Jewish festivals, and mm -hmm. special rites, and so forth. You know, you're supposed to drink you know, so many Passover and so many at the birth of a child and so forth. Um, I guess Purim, you can drink as much as you want. <laughs> and then even in Islam, you know, once you get to heaven or afterlife, uh, paradise, uh, you can drink as much wine as you want too. So wine is sort of embedded in our culture, but then if you go to, say, Nigeria or parts of West Africa, it's usually a sorghum or a millet which they have uh, uh, been using over millennia, really. And so we have, in my book on Corky in the Past, I give an example from uh, Burkina Faso, in which they're still using the same kind of mashing setup today as they did around 3000 BC in ancient Egypt. Wow. So that is like, <laughs> you know, a 5,000 year continuous tradition. So one of the things which is interesting about looking at um, the part of the world I do, the Near East, some of this ethnographic information is quite useful for understanding certain biochemical technologies, principally fermentation, because an awful lot of these early beers, um, so these, these sort of you know, very young beers get produced in African villages like Buza, you can't actually store them. There's no shelf for that life for them whatsoever. They go off, off after about a day. Um, so all our modern uh, fermentation technology is really geared towards having a sort of a biologically stable beverage which you can lay aside for a time. 
Um, in the vast majority of instances, that's not what the technology was geared to. So that gives you slightly different ideas about fermentation. Equally, the type of fermentation as well. Was it just a yeast-based fermentation? How many species are you looking at? What was the bacterial element as well? So any beer that's got souring in it will have a lactobacillus activity as well. So by looking at these ethnographic examples from all over the world, it gives you not, it doesn't tell you how they did it, but it gives you clues about the likely realities of doing, making beer in a certain way. So you can, and that in turn is a very big issue when you're doing these recreation beverages as well, because there's a very big difference between making something which is authentic based on spontaneous fermentation and then something you can actually serve to people based on health and safety law as well. So that's something that, that is something that comes into it, which is a, a real issue. I've, um, just my own thing I'm working on at the moment, um, we've been looking at a bit of bittering agent called uh, polygonum. So um, you can, polygonum avicular is something which you can get in health food stores as well. Like It's sort of not weed tea, not grass tea. And also that horrible stuff that destroys your pavements outside your houses, that's not weed as well. One of the real issues with knotweed, which we discovered when we sort of did a little toxicological work upon it, is yes, it does work fantastically well as a bittering agent, because it's antimicrobial, it has a bitter taste to it, and it's antioxidative, so it's perfect for brewing. The downside of it is that some species in that region have a sky-high um, concentration of oxalic acid in them. Oxalic acid, if you remember, your mum always told you not to eat the leaves from rhubarb. Right, so I've been to, well, some people's mum said it, right? Every, every day when I leave the house, I came and leave me alone. Right, so do, but one of the issues is if you actually go out and eat rhubarb crumble, if, you, if I sent you all out there and you had 16 rhubarb crumbles in a row, you'd all be in hospital with kidneys, kidney problems. One of the issues is with oxalic acid is it leads to the formation of kidney stones because it bonds with calcium in a small amount of liquid, that concentration can be very dangerous. So one of the things, we haven't really sort of come up with a, I mean, very open to ideas here, way of sort of testing dead people <laughs> for sort of kidneys. It's all soft tissue damage, but there is an issue with cumulative toxicity to this stuff. So if you all drank uh, polygonum-flavored beer for a month, you'd all start feeling a bit funny. But it's one of those things which is extremely difficult to test in the archaeological record. So we must presume that they found a way of getting around this through some sort of processing aid. So that's that's one of the interesting things you can find out about combining the two perspectives. So, are we finished with Pretend Pat now? We are finished with Pretend Pat. Thank you very much, Pretend Pat. I'll just speak to you soon. He's not here. We're literally clapping the screen. He's, uh, actually, he's still in bed. He hasn't even got up yet. He's, he's in the morning. So, um, right. How, how should we do this? So. I think you can keep it on, Mike, if we're happy to take questions. Okay, yeah, sure. Um, obviously, I appreciate that was quite strange, and I thank you all bearing with me. Uh, uh, You'd be pleased to know the fire damage to the office building on Monday was minimal as well, so that, that building will be back in use next week. Um, in more general terms, I'm quite happy to take any questions on biochemical aspects of this sort of thing, or I can answer some basic questions about Pat's recreation brews as well. Uh, just, just on the recreation brew, yep. um, there must be a festival 2015. Um, as part of our theme, we were celebrating the 15th century, mm. and one brewery in Staffordshire they recreated a 15th century beer using a recipe, and they said it was a complete disaster. It took, yeah. it took four separate attempts to get it someone into the recipe, and he would never do it again <laughs> <laughs> because he found it so difficult. Which mm. tends to suggest there wasn't an awful lot of quality control in the old days. Um, <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I would say that. I mean, when, when you... So a lot of the stuff Pat's been doing is... Um, it's really in the late Bronze Age that you start to get evidence for some sort of specialisation of labour, so something approaching a brewery specialist. And frequently it's associated with temples, actually, in the Near East. So um, when, when you get into, yeah, specialisation of beer through people actually making it on a regular basis, you see a slight change in quality control, I would say. Um, when it's still being done, the sort of you know a sort of small scale folksy thing. Yes, I think it was absolutely a very you know uh, f affected activity on many occasions. There's many reasons for that, which you can quantify to an extent. So seasonality was a very important aspect. When you're dealing with something which is essentially relying on wild yeast fermentation, the time of year affects the wider uh, floral population, which very much affects how your brew is going to turn out. 
So there would have been large sections of the year, like high summer, for example, you simply couldn't brew in high summer because you'd just end up with something that just wouldn't work. There'd be too much activity in there. Um, one of the big issues, which one of the shortcomings, really, and I think another one of our speakers will be talking about this, with these ancient beverages, is you can get a very clear idea of the ingredients. What you have a lot more trouble uh, with is the proportionality of the ingredients. Because um, while you can use chemical residue analysis to tell you what was in it, you can t tell how much was in it. And there's also lots of imponderable aspects of the process as well. How long did they hold the mash? To what extent was the starch converted into sugar before fermentation began? What was being done to the malt, the grain, before it was processed through? Was it even malted in some cases? There are some examples where they're using unmalted grain as a, a way to control the extent of fermentation. So if you want to make a very weak beer, you're putting in an awful lot of unmalted, which kind of goes against our ideas of how to make beer. But it was their sort of way of gauging the strength and weakness and characteristics of the beer. So, yes, there's a, I think one of the issues with reconstructive things is when you go from the science and move to the other, just on terms of ingredients, you've got huge problems in knowing what they were doing with it. So that's a rambling answer to a short question. <laughs>